this is the Provoke Prawn, and this is the Fractal Design North. This is the mesh variant of the case, which as you can see includes not only a mesh side panel, but also a front wooden panel with options that allow for oak or walnut choices, which is pretty nifty. Now this is a full in-depth build guide, which is going to take quite some time, but I'm going to show you all the different features of this case. I've actually built it in two different ways, so I want to show you some of the things I discovered along the way and things to think about if you're going to be purchasing this case and if you're building in it and you want to know more about it. This is the mesh version of the case, which means as a perforated side panel, which is particularly interesting later on because the mesh version also comes with the option to install extra fans in an interesting position, which I want to show you and some interesting highlights there. Now, immediately I was struck by obviously the design of it is very nice looking. The thumb screws on here, though, are a bit tricky to get off, and that applies to all the thumb screws throughout the case. So you'll see me struggling with some of them, and I want to note that I did need a screwdriver for the majority of them. So just bear that in mind if you're doing the build, you might find they are a bit stiff in places. Now, this is a flexible case which allows for a 360mm radiator on the front or 240mm radiator on top and as you can see multiple panels come off including a front one in a minute which doubles as a cable hiding tray which is pretty nice and it has some interesting highlights to it obviously you get all the usual dust shields that you'd expect so you can see when you pull off that wooden front there's a mesh panel on the other side for protecting it from dust and that can be popped out of the front panel as well so you can then clean that up in future under there, you have two 140mm aspect fans. So you get two fans included as standard. Now I'm going to be swapping those out in this build, but I will talk about the wiring logic if you want to just use those fans and then throw a radiator or CPU tower into this case. So I want to show what you can do there and the logic of it. So there are pre-installed two on the front. So you've got 240 mils, but you could fit three 120 mil if you wanted to fill that front panel up with fans. So that's something to consider, but it is nice to have those two large fans included as standard in a case that's already nice looking and pretty flexible in some ways. Also interesting note that there is a fan splitter at the top here. So there's a little controller at the top of the case, which allows you to plug fans into it. Worth noting that those front fans aren't plugged into it as standard though. You'll see the cable routing for the front panel, top USB-C and USB-A connections on the left-hand side, and I'll show you wiring for that in a minute. And then on the right-hand side behind the motherboard tray, there's an SSD section. So you've actually got mounting points for multiple SSDs and hard disk drives. And there's a close-up look at the fan splitter. So this is a four-way fan splitter, so you can plug four fans into that. And then it has a connection that goes to a cis fan head on your motherboard, which I'll show you later. Weirdly, it doesn't have its own power, though, so I'd be wary of plugging four fans into that and then running them off a single header. The front panel connections, you can see here, USB-A, 3.5mm HD audio and a USB-C, and then you have a power switch, power LED, plus and minus connections that need to be sorted out, and I'll show you where to plug those in later on if you're not aware. You can see me just quickly plugging in the cables for those two front fans. Now it's worth noting they actually have daisy chain connections on them so you can connect them up together. You could plug them directly into the motherboard or you could use this controller, just plug them in there and then plug the cable from that into the motherboard, which might make your wiring a bit neater at the front of the case and obviously gives you some flexibility. At the bottom of the case, you have two hard disk drive trays, which again are held in with thumb screws. And again, they're pretty tough to get out. I did have to use a screwdriver and you can see you can just tug those out. Now, these are actually interesting because you can fit one hard disk drive in each of them or alternatively, you can put SSDs in there and it gets more interesting than that. Also, they've got what looks like Mickey Mouse on the side of them, but there's a reason for that. And we'll talk about that in a minute as well. So now I've stripped down most of the case to show it from the various different angles. You can see it looks kind of empty at the front with those 240 mils. Obviously, they're positioned at the top of the case, which is probably beneficial. You won't have any airflow necessarily going over the hard disk drives, though, which will be at the bottom, which is where you might want to think about 320 mils instead. So to show you one way things are possible or one potential way you could do things, I've installed an NZXT Kraken Z73, which is a 360 mil radiator on the front of this case, along with some 120mm Lee and Lee fans, which is the AL120 V2 fans. 
And there are some problems with that, so more on that in a little while. And then this is actually what I'm going to end up with, which is a Fractal Lumen 240mm S24 RGB cooler, and obviously some RGB fans, which I have separately, and I'll obviously leave the specs of these in the description. But what makes this case interesting is that you can do this. So you'll see that you can put some fans on the side. And this is a fan tray, which I'll show later on, which can be positioned into three potential different places on the case, bottom, middle, and top, depending on your setup. And you can then obviously shut that mesh panel on it and close it away. Now I've obviously put RGB fans in there and you can see the RGB shines through. So some interesting highlights, but that'll keep your GPU cool. Now for this build, I'm using an MSI Z790 Gaming Pro Wi-Fi and I'm going to leave all the specs in the description, but you can see we've got 64 gigs of Kingston Fury Beast RAM, two WD Black SN850s, and a Crucial P3. Now this motherboard I'm going to do a video on separately, but it has the option to install three NVMe SSDs, so I wanted to do that and see how I got on with it, because I'm going to be reviewing it separately, but obviously you don't necessarily need three. You could just use one and then SSD connections and things. Plenty of I.O. as you can see at the rear. So lots of flexibility and ease of use there. This is a DDR5 motherboard. So that's that Fury Beast. And I'm using a 12th gen Intel CPU for this, the i9-12900K. Simply because I'm going to be testing the Lumen cooler out. And I want to see how it handled this CPU because this one run particularly hot because obviously is the top end of the 12th gen, but obviously this is a 13th gen motherboard, so I could potentially have used an i9-13900K instead. That might have been a bit more logical. Now with the RAM, you'll notice a close-up look at it. You should install in slots A2 and B2. It's clearly marked on the motherboard. If you just got two sticks, those two slots are the ones you want to use. So that's the second slot in, and then the fourth slot to the right. If you're using four, obviously you can fill it up. Now, worth bearing in mind that motherboards, DDR5, XMP, there are some problems with it. And I did actually find that I couldn't get it to boot with the four sticks. So you might have to take two out if you have problems, but that's a different issue. DDR5 can be a problem. Sometimes BIOS updates fix it. So it's worth bearing those things in mind, but that's a separate issue. And as I said, I'm gonna do a video separately on this motherboard. And I've also done one on DDR5 RAM if you're interested. But you'll see we can just pop off all the different parts here. Now I'm going to get back to the case in a minute, obviously, but I want to show you the preparation. I'd recommend doing all of this outside the case beforehand, getting your motherboard ready for the install process because you don't want to be installing drives when it's inside the case. It makes life a lot easier if you do this. And we can see we pop off all the shielding and then we have three spots for the NVMe SSDs. These SSDs are fantastic because they are really fast. This is a Gen 4 setup, so these are all Gen 4 drives, or at least the WD Black are, which means they'll run at top speeds on this board. There's thermal pads underneath the heat shieldings on the top. Make sure you take the stickers off even if you're using a different motherboard, and I do mean on the thermal pads, not on the drives themselves. I've done a separate video on whether you should remove the stickers from your NVMe SSDs that I'll link to in the description. But as you can see, the conclusion from that video is that you shouldn't, which is why I'm leaving mine on, because sometimes they're thermally conductive and they actually help dissipate that heat and it can actually void your warranty and other considerations as well. But what you do need to do is make sure that the thermal pads have good application because these heat shields actually make quite a difference in the majority of cases because they help to just cool the drives and ensure that they run as they should at the right speeds. And then there's obviously a lot of screws. Now you will note with this motherboard and a lot of others that there's a lot of different screws holding these things down. On this motherboard, that top NVMe port actually had a Q-latch or a plastic clip which holds the drive in place. These other ones require a screw that goes through the heat shield and then into the standoff to screw it down. Sometimes you'll find a motherboard requires an M2 screw to hold your NVMe SSD down. This is not the case here, it's actually with the shielding, which is pretty interesting. And you just need to line those screws up with the standoffs and then screw them in. You might not want to populate all the slots on your motherboard, something to think about, and I'll talk about why in a separate video. Now I am preparing the installation of the Kraken cooler. So this is a 360mm cooler. Now I noticed with this case that it looked like it was roomy enough for what I'm planning, which is actually to install push-pull setup, so with six fans on that radiator, 
to maximize performance. You'll see on this case that there's another panel which you can remove from the front. It has a thumb screw at the top and then it pulls out. And then you'll see that you have access to the front area where the fans are for a bit more easy reach. But as you'll see, there's also a large area where the PSU shroud is covering the bottom where you can essentially put your radiator in there. Now this could be handy in different ways. You might be able to do tubes down if you want to put your tubes at the bottom of the radiator because I know some people want to do that. And alternatively, you could consider push-pull as I have. I thought it would be roomy enough to do this, but I actually do come unstuck in a minute. So this is why I'm doing this because I want to show you what not to do and some of the considerations for this as we go through. Now, because I'm trying to do push-pull and I'm not going to be using these front fans, I'm taking them out for now. So removing the 140 mil fans and obviously putting the radiator on the front. Now, if you're wondering about the best position for your all-in-one cooler, I've actually done a video separately where I tested various different positions and what the best position was for yours. So be sure to check that out. But here I'm mounting it on the front to show what's possible because you can have a 360 mil radiator on the front or 240 on the top. So those are basically your options for this case because the 360 won't go on top, unfortunately. So if you are front mounting as I have, then you have to think about where the fans are going to go. And because I'm doing a push-pull setup here or trying, I'm putting fans on the front with the long radiator screws going through the fans into the radiator to hold it into the case. So it's basically going through the fans, through the fan tray, and then into the rad, and then that will hold the whole thing down. But as you'll see in a second, and as I've already said, don't do this because this won't work, or doing push-pull won't work. But actually, if you are front-mounting your radiator, this is how you'd want to do it. You want the fans on the outside of the case, pulling air across the radiator and into the case. So then I've got that set up and it still looks like there's plenty of room here and then we install the motherboard and actually what you'll notice is there is still a decent amount of room. I've seen smaller cases where I've done push pulls where there's been a problem but you can see you can still access the rear of the case in terms of the cable management on the right hand side so it might still be possible but this depends highly on your GPU as I'll show you in a second. Now, obviously, when installing the motherboard, we want to make sure you secure the standoff screws. These are properly marked in the little accessories box that you'll see that comes with the case that was in the hard disk drive tray. And then I'm securing the cooler down. Now, you have options with this. You can do tubes on the right hand side or tubes below with this cooler. I've done a video separately on this naturally that you can find out more about the wiring of it and the setup. And one thing to consider with this case, which is interesting, is that you'll see there's a lack of space above the motherboard for running cables through to the rear. And I'll get to that later on because that actually becomes a bit of a problem. And it would with this cooler, and it will probably with any other all-in-one cooler that you use. There's one slot just above the left-hand top of the motherboard there for running cables through to the rear. There's very little otherwise above the motherboard, which is fairly unusual. And it's one of my complaints about this case. But here you can see RTX 3090 from Gigabyte will not fit in this push-pull logic. Space is unfortunately limited. So if you have a larger, more powerful graphics card, which is long, then you'll probably find that it won't fit in there. Now you can get pretty compact GPUs nowadays, so it might not be an issue. But you can see if we measure it out, you're looking at about 30 centimeters, which is 300 mil and that's about the maximum length that you can do if you're doing push-pull with a front-mounted radiator. Something to bear in mind, just consider that. Now, I'll leave, obviously, the specs and compatibility of the case in the description so you can find out more about it. But the good news is that you could just abandon these fans inside the case on the rear side of the all-in-one cooler, and because they're not holding the cooler in place, you can just take that off, and then, you know, that's the setup. Now we've got a lot more room. So that frees up that room. Obviously, the cooling won't be quite as good, but it should still be good enough. And that is one option that gives you a lot more length. And then you can then use the fans that we weren't using for top mounting them instead to have exhaust there and then a rear fan as well. So one of the things of interest here is you'll see, obviously, we've got options for 120 or 140 mil fans on the top. As I said, you can put 240 mil radiator up here, but you can also put 240 mil fans or 220 mil fans. And then you also have the potential for mounting another fan at the rear, which I'll show you in a second. But you can see now we've ditched those fans on the other side of the radiator. There's enough room for the 3090. So that shouldn't be a problem. If you have a smaller GPU, 3060 maybe, or something else similar, 
and there should be even more space. Now, at the rear, you can fit a 120mm fan on there, which is maybe a bit upsetting for some people. I've seen complaints that you can put 140mm on the front, 140mm on the top, but only 120 on the rear. I've seen that with other cases. People complaining about that. And I actually felt it this time because I was going to reuse the standard case fans and move them to the back of the case. But you can't do that because you need 120mm. But this is a finished product of what it looks like with Lian Lee's AL120 V2 fans, which I think probably would look pretty good. It doesn't make much sense to use RGB fans on a mesh case where there's no glass panel, because obviously you're going to put a glass panel over the side of it. But you can actually still see the RGB through that mesh, as I've shown and as you'll see. So pretty nice and interesting results there and you can see it's a good solidly built case from what i've seen from the build process it seems nice and solid and well designed now back to standard so back to the way it was and i want to talk about the line logic and then we're going to get into the standard build so i'm just going to quickly show you how to install ssds and hard disk drives you'll see that accessories box that i was talking about comes out of the bottom hard drive tray and then it has the labeling on it for each of what all the screws are that are included in there and i've obviously removed the drive caddies from the bottom as well the thing that's interesting here is you can see i've got one hard disk drive and two ssds that i'm going to show you how to install and the setup for this is fairly straightforward but you have different screws so if you're in doing an ssd then you'd use the same screws that you use for installing the motherboard but if you're using hard disk drive there's these anti-vibration washers that install on the side of the tray and that they go inside the Mickey Mouse ears. But the Mickey Mouse ears are actually there because you can install the hard disk drives in the different positions. So you can install it at the bottom of the tray or at the top and I'll show you why in a minute. But you basically install these washers in the side edges there of Mickey Mouse's ears and then you install the screws through there and there's different screws for the hard disk drives as there are versus the SSDs. So obviously you've got two hard disk drive mounting points in here and if you're not using hard disk drives as I'll show you in a second you can use SSDs instead. So potentially you've got a reasonable amount of storage. Now you can actually use two hard disk drives and four SSDs potentially in this build and I'll show you how you do that in a minute. So if you include that as well as the three NVMe SSDs that we have that's a lot of potential storage that you can cram into what is actually a pretty small case it's not tiny but it is a smallish atx case so it's pretty interesting but the setup there obviously you can just slip your drive into the caddy making sure the connections face the right way because we need to make sure we can access them obviously when it's installed into the case so towards the thumb screw because that's going to be the front or the rear of the case and where the cables are going to run and then you just screw the longer screws that are in the box through the washers into the side into the four points on the hard disk drives i've skipped some of the screwing in because obviously it's going to take some time so this process has been sped up for your viewing pleasure but you will find it's fairly straightforward but what i did think was interesting is obviously that's a pretty basic standard setup for the hard disk drives but where it becomes more interesting is if you want to install ssds because you can use the same tray and also that same tray can also hold both SSDs and hard disk drives at the same time, as I'll show you in a second. So here I've got a nice cheap Kingston drive that I'm using for demo purposes. The logic is the same, except it screws in on the underside. So you have to flip it over, line up the holes, and then use, as I said, the small screws which are designed to install the motherboard as well. So they've got a sort of flat head on them and then a little round bobble on top of that, and it's a Phillips screw head and they screw into the four corners of the drive there and secure it down. Now, obviously, those rubber grommets that you saw on the hard disk drives are anti-vibration mounts as well because of the moving parts in the hard drive, but with an SSD, there's no moving parts, so it can secure straight down to this tray, and then you won't have any noise off of it, so it's probably beneficial in that way, and they're easier to install, frankly. And then you have that setup so that could be your basic setup of one hard disk drive and one ssd but maybe you want to use another one so i've got a wd green ssd here install that on the bottom uses the same logic this is the other tray obviously now there is something else to note that i'll show you in a minute but you might want to think about the size of your power supply unit and how many ssds or hard disk drives you're going to be using because there's actually limited space at the bottom of the case where these caddies install and you might want to use a different position 
altogether, and I'll show you what I mean in a second. But you can obviously remove these, so if you're not going to use them, you could take them out, and that will make life a little bit easier. Now, with the SSD mounted on the bottom of this tray, you can then put your anti-vibration mountings on the top of Mickey Mouse's ears on the other side, and then we can basically put the hard disk drive at the top instead. So you can put the SSD below the hard disk drive. Now, the implications of this, whether it's going to cause problems, the drives aren't actually touching, but whether you want two drives so close to each other, that's going to be up to you. It's not something I've been able to test, like whether temperatures are going to be a problem. There is a gap, though, because you do have to hold the hard disk drive in the air in order to screw the screws through that washer and into the drive. So the logic is the same, the installation logic, but we're now doing it at the top of the bay instead of at the bottom of the bay. And then you have, do have a bit of a fiddle to try and reach the connectors, because you can see, obviously, we've got the SATA power and the data connections on the drives. You need to access both of those. And when it's installed in the case, they do become a little bit fiddly. So that's something to watch out for when you get to that process. In I'll show you that in a second. So if we put those caddies back in, obviously you can re-secure the thumb screws. You'll see that there's marks on here for where you position them. So they're fairly easy to install, but also obviously you can take them out. One thing I noticed immediately is that obviously with the drive in there, there's quite a limited looking space in there. So just to test it out, I'm using NZXT C1200 power supply unit, obviously a pretty hefty beast and with its cables already plugged in. More on how you actually set this up later, but you can see that once you've done that, there's a lot of cables then pushing up against the drives. Actually, it was okay. I still managed to build in there, but if you have a particularly large one, that might be worth considering. The other thing, the other option you have is here is another removable tray, which again will take an SSD and obviously it will take two SSDs. So instead of using those bottom trays, if you're planning on just using SSDs, you could mount them to this tray and then mount it to the back of where the motherboard is essentially. And then you could just abandon those bottom trays and free up the space for your power supply cables down the bottom, which would probably be my preference. So if I was sticking with SSDs and there were no hard disk drives in the build, then you could just do this and you could have two drives there and just loads of free space down the bottom, which would be better. And then plugging in the cables a lot easier as well, because you can see the data cable plugs into the drive there. But when I try and access the one on the bottom with the hard disk drive and the SSD, is a lot more fiddly because you're trying to basically get it underneath there. Admittedly, you could just take the drive out, plug the cables in, then do it. <laughs> so we're now into the Fractal Lumen S24 RGB. I'm going to do a separate video on this where I'm doing thermal testing and other things and, and show the installation for... AMD builds, but here I'm going to show you the setup for this build with this Intel setup. And luckily enough, it's already set up perfectly for Intel. So it comes pre applied with thermal paste, and the bracketing that you can see on the pump head is for Intel socket as well. So it will work with LGA 1700 with the 13th and 12th gen CPUs and those motherboards. And the installation is actually really straightforward as well the good thing about this cooler is it doesn't require any software it's all managed from the motherboard and that includes the rgb lighting but that is something to think about because you do need a 5 volt rgb header on your motherboard which most modern motherboards do have but we'll get to that in a little while and you'll see interesting setup as well because this is an all-in-one cooler which obviously has all the coolant in it already but it also has the pump in the radiator rather than in the the block that goes over the CPU, which you can see the cable coming out of here, and we need to run that into the motherboard. But that's fairly unusual design. There's also a lot of other things included. So I said there's pre-applied thermal paste. You also get an extra tube of thermal paste just in case you want it. You also have some RGB fans. And again, you might question why you want RGB fans in a case where you can't really see. But as I said, you can actually see through it, so it's not too much of a problem. And what I'm trying to do here is work out where I'm going to be installing the all-in-one cooler, because you can obviously put the tubes at the front of the case or at the rear, and actually what you're going to do might vary depending on how you're setting it up. So if you're putting a rear fan at the back of the case, you might not want to do it like this with the tubes at the rear. Uh, I did actually opt for it this way around because I'm not doing that but also because the cable from the radiator is currently running that way towards the back of the case, although you can reposition that without much fuss. But I thought the tubes would probably look neater this way around. As a personal preference, it doesn't really matter. You just need to work out which way you're going to do, which way will fit in your build, 
and then make sure you've sort of thought about that logic before you go to the setup of the fans because I'm going to set the fans up to exhaust air through the radiator, which means we're going to put them face down into the case, so like this. And we need to make sure that the cabling is facing towards the rear so that we can tidy things up and hide away a lot of that cabling. Although it will be hidden behind mesh later on, we still need to make sure it doesn't get in the way or impede airflow in any way. So there are some long screws included with this all-in-one cooler which go through the fan and into the radiator and then you get some small screws to screw it into the case itself which I'll show you in a little while. These are nice and easy to install and the wiring is actually fairly straightforward too. So these are RGB fans which means they have two cables, one RGB and one fan power. But what you will notice is that each cable also has another connector on it. And that's because essentially you can daisy chain these connections together. So both the fan power and the RGB lighting can be connected up from each fan. So you can create a loop or a chain through these. So here you can see me connecting the fan power from one fan to the other, for example. And then all you need to do is work out where you're going to plug in the fan connector, which I'll show you in a second. So both fans are powered off one connector rather than two separate ones, which makes things neater on the motherboard. Then you have the RGB connector, which is the three pin connector for five volt RGB control. Now this is done via your motherboard software. So in my case, MSI Mystic Lite, for example, uh, it depends on your motherboard, but that's the setup here. Again, that's chained together. So the RGB connector from one fan connects up to the other fan, and then you have another connector and so you can keep that chain going. This is useful because as you'll see later on, I obviously throw in some extra RGB fans that are also fractal fans, and you can connect those up to the system as well, and that way you can ensure the RGB across the entire case is synced and is really easy to do as well. So in this setup, you get a little RGB cable that comes out of the CPU block, and that also has a five volt connector on it, and that can then continue the chain on. So you've got an RGB connector from here to the fans and then the fans onwards either to your motherboard or to other fans that are then in turn connected to the motherboard. And I'll show you where to plug that in in a second. But a very simple setup. This is one of the easiest setups in terms of a all-in-one cooler that I've seen because there's nothing else to connect from the pump head. Usually you'd have a USB connection but this is all controlled with your motherboard's RGB software, so it's worth bearing that in mind. That's going to vary from motherboard to motherboard, but you can use that to sync the RGB lighting across the fans. So then you'll see that we do have a mess of cables to deal with, and that is a little bit problematic, and I'll get to that later on and how I resolved it. But this cable connects up to the 5 volt RGB header on the motherboard, and you usually find a couple of those on motherboards. You can see this one is marked as J. A R G B in the top right, but there's also another one located elsewhere on the motherboard, and you often find them at the top and bottom. But you do want that five volt one, which is three pins. Sometimes you'll find a 12 volt one, which has four pins on it, but you won't be able to use that, obviously, because this cable won't work with that because there's a one pin missing. So that wouldn't be the one you'd want to use. Next, fan power. Now, fan power, as I've said, you can connect the two fans together or you could do them separately. Now, interestingly, the manual recommends connecting them up to a system fan header, but I'd suggest because they're on the radiator for your all-in-one cooler, it's better to connect them up to the CPU fan header on the motherboard. So use that daisy chain logic to connect the two fans together, and then instead of using the sys fan header, although if you do want to, you'll see one on the right-hand side here, and alternatively, you'll find a bunch of them elsewhere, I'd use the CPU fan header at the top. This is logical because obviously your CPU fan is what's going to be controlling the fan speed of this cooler, so the fans on the radiator. And then what we're going to do separately is connect the radiator pump to the all-in-one pump header on the motherboard. Now obviously, if your motherboard only has a CPU fan connection, you'd connect the all-in-one pump to the CPU fan header and then your fans to the system fan. So that is one place it would apply. But usually you'd find pump, fan, or AIO pump connection on the motherboard, and that's where you'd plug the pump in, and then the fan would go to the CPU fan. That's how I would do it. Next stage is preparing the motherboard standoff. So there's a backplate standoffs, so there's long screws that pass through the motherboard. 
and some other bits. So this is the logic for Intel, because this is an Intel build. If you want to see the AMD setup, as I said, I'm going to be doing a video separately on the S24 where I go into that. But what we've got to do for this is because it's LGA 1700, you make sure that the standoffs are in the far corners. So what you'll see with the back plate is they push out to the very edges of this and then you'd stick that through and then put the washers down over the top. You'll see that these long standoffs actually have a flat side on one edge of them and that's the sort of way they push into and sort of notch into the back plate and it's one place to keep an eye on when you're installing them, how that works, because that'll ensure good fitment. And then we need to put this on the back of the motherboard. Now you'll see why we're doing this outside the case before we've even put it in the case, because it makes life a little bit easier. You can actually access the back of this, though, if you do need to, when the motherboard's installed in the case, there is an area where you can access it. It just makes life a little bit more straightforward when doing it this way. So make sure you line it up so that Intel's written across the top, and then we just pushing that down so the standoffs push through the holes on the motherboard to the other side and then we're going to secure those because you also have some washers to push to on the other side. Now these go in the four corners obviously over the top of those standoffs and pay attention to how they go on because one way they basically hold the standoffs in place and the other way around actually is loose so I found I had to flip one over as you've seen there. And then I'm putting the motherboard into the case. Obviously, I did this earlier on with the Kraken setup, but I took the whole thing out so I could show you the process for doing it again in this more logical way. So we're setting that up and then install the standoff screws. Now, the case is set up for ATX motherboards. So if you're using one like this, then it will just sit on the standoffs that are already there. And then you just use the little screws, same ones that we use for the SSDs to hold it down in the several places. Now for this build I'm using the NZXTC 1200 power supply unit as I showed earlier on. This is a modular PSU, I've done a video on it separately, but here I'm going to show you the wiring logic for what we're using in this build so it's easy to set up in case you're doing something similar. So a 24 pin power supply cable, this goes to the motherboard 20 plus 4 connectors on the power supply. That's split into two parts here, you want to plug that end into the power supply unit and then the other end goes into the motherboard. This is one of the most important cables because it ensures the motherboard will actually turn on. So if it's not connected fully to the power supply or to your motherboard, that will cause problems. The other cables we're going to be using for this motherboard is two 8-pin CPU power connectors. You'll see them clearly marked with CPU and they plug into the CPU and PCIe section on the power supply. Now, you won't always have two 8-pin CPU power connectors on all motherboards. Obviously on this motherboard I do, you may not, you might have one 8-pin, one 4-pin, sometimes that's the way. Um, with these 8-pins they can actually be split in half, so that's how you do that connection if you do do it. Now I'm sh quickly showing you this now for ease of use, just so you can see how it works. So that's the 24-pin, plugs it in on the right-hand side. Obviously you wouldn't do this now, you do it when it's all in the case, but I want to show it so you can easily see it. And then the two 8-pin CPU power connectors they go in the top left. So that ensures the board has enough power and you can do things like overclocking and also just so it's got enough power for everything that's going on here. Because obviously we've got a lot of things with all the various drives and fans and SSDs and all sorts of other things. And talking of SSDs, this is the SSD hard drive cables is SATA power. So we're looking for the peripheral and SATA connections on your power supply unit. And then you've got flat daisy chain power cables that connect up to the SSDs that we've installed and hard disk drives. And if you're using them, other fan controllers, maybe all in one coolers, if you're using something different to what I am. But you can see that's the flat connector. It actually has an L shaped connection inside of it. So you can only plug it in one way. So if you find it's not going on properly, then you need to flip it over, which I always get it the wrong way around when I'm doing it because I'm not looking because I'm trying to record the footage. So don't worry if you do too, just have a little look. You'll see that it notches on there and then you just slip that in. Now as I said, this is daisy chainable, which means there's multiple connections on each cable, which means you can actually plug in several devices. So two SSDs, for example, one SSD and a hard disk drive, you can run those off of there. Now for the graphics card powering, this is a eight pin PCIe cable. That will plug into the PCIe slash CPU section of the power supply unit. Obviously it's for the graphics card. I'm using two 8-pin power connectors here with the PCIe Logic and the 3090. I'll show you a 40 series graphics card in a second, which will hopefully help out if you're using a newer GPU. But you'll often find that you have this pigtail cable with two connectors on it. I'd actually try and use two single connectors if you do have them, if that's possible. 
running those from the power supply to the graphics card instead with straight connectors rather than that pigtail one. You don't really want to use that if you can have dedicated power for each of these connectors. But what you need to do is push the two connectors together on that eight pin because you'll find there's a six and a two. They're loose. You have to sort of pinch them together and push them in and notch them into the holes there and make sure they're clipped in nicely. They're a bit fiddly to do. Again, I'm showing you this now so you can get a view of how to do it. But obviously you'd actually do it when the power supply is in the case and the graphics cards in the case as well. But I'll show you that again later. I just wanted to see how to do it now for your ease. For the 40 series GPU, we have this 600 watt cable with a slightly different design. You'll see it has extra pins on it and it is quite small the way it's pinned out and it's plugged in the bottom right now. A lot of newer ATX 3.0 power supply units have this connector on them and it makes life a little neater in terms of the connector because you've only got one cable and one connection on the graphics card. It is a bit fiddly. You do need to make sure it's pushed in all the way and it can be hard to do, but there's a gigabyte 4070 for demo purposes. And then we need to mount the power supply. Now there's not much space down the bottom here if you've got a large PSU, so you can't actually put it in in the sort of traditional way through the gap there. We have to slide it in from the end. And in order to do that, you first need to take off this back plate at the rear, which is held in place with thumb screws. And what that does is it seats over the top of the power supply and that's how you secure it. So if you move the case out of the way for a minute, you can then put that over the top of the power supply unit, screw that down and then put the PSU into the case and secure it with the thumb screws. So you'll find four screws included here, which you just need to screw into those few corners that line up with the screw holes in the power supply unit. Now obviously you need to pay attention to the size. I've already shown you how larger PSUs might interfere with hard disk drives and things. I'll leave the compatibility specs in the description so you can find out more about it. But this is a 1200 watt PSU, which is pretty hefty to be honest. So you're unlikely to find that you're gonna get a PSU that's much bigger than this that will have a problem fitting in there. So I wouldn't worry too much about space and if you are finding you're a bit lax on it, then just try moving one of those hard disk drive trays out of the way if you're not going to be using that. Again, thumb screws were a bit fiddly, so something to bear in mind. Now we're running the power cable. So those two 8-pin power supply cables for the CPU run up the right-hand side here. There are cable tidying loops and hooks across this side, but I also found that I could just stuff them into the corners here along that edge which is good because I'm probably going to be taking this case apart again and building something else in the near future. So I wanted to avoid using cable ties as much as possible. And despite the lack of cable channeling, it's actually fairly easy to neaten things up. There are various different hooks along here, so it is pretty easy. But they go through there and obviously 24-pin power cable goes on the right-hand side of the motherboard and then the 8 pins on the top left. A little bit fiddly, but you can see there's actually a decent amount of space. Now, you'll note I'm doing this now before I install it all in one cooler just so it's easy to access these things. I also wanted to be able to demonstrate the other things. So we're going to do USB and SATA connections, for example. So the data connections from the SSDs and hard disk drives. So it's all straightforward for you. So the USB-C connector plugs in just underneath the 24 pin power supply cable. You can actually see that this is notched as well. So you can only plug it in one way round. So it's worth paying attention to that. Despite the fact USB-C can be plugged in whatever way you want on the other end on your case, you actually have to take care when plugging in on the inside and you will notice it clicks into place when it's done. The data connections go on the bottom right of the motherboard and they're at an angle and you'll see how they're notched into place there. And I've got two connectors here. I'd actually have three with hard disk drives and SSDs and then obviously don't forget the power connectors as well. This is where things become a bit tricky because obviously this connector is fine for plugging in the power for this Kingston drive, but the other ones that are mounted on those bays below are a little bit more fiddly to get in there. What I did find though is despite the amount of cables that I've got connected up here, because it's quite a lot, there is a nice bit to tuck most of these cables away. That is, of course, noting that you have the drives down there, so they are going to maybe be in the way of those, so that's something to bear in mind. Then we've got the HD audio, which is a 3.5mm connection, and USB-A. So that one actually was pretty tricky. Now, the USB-A connector on this motherboard is in the bottom right, and there's actually two of them, so that's interesting. 
and unusual and also the placement is unusual because usually it's there on the right hand side just below the USB-C so it may vary worth checking your motherboard manual if you aren't sure but here's another motherboard and you'll see it's on the right hand side instead of in the bottom right next is the HD audio this is the 3.5 mil jack that goes on the top of the case and this plugs in on the bottom left of the motherboard you're looking for HD audio J audio and other things like that you should find it in the manual but usually it's in the bottom left and you need to connect that up so you can use the 3.5 mil connector and then we've got the power switch and power LEDs so that's obviously the indicator to let you know when the power is turned on now you'll find instructions in the motherboard manual on how these connect up and where they plug into. I've done a guide separately on this if you're not sure, but I'm just going to quickly demo this for this motherboard. Obviously it will vary from motherboard to motherboard, so you need to refer to your manual really in order to do it. But basically we need to line up the power switch with the right pins on this. Obviously there's more pins than there are connectors because sometimes you'd have hard disk drive, LEDs, reset switches as well, which is, is lacking on this case. You only have the power switch and the power indicators. So we're actually not using all the connectors. So it's worth bearing in mind, but they're basically going on the top row with the power LED indicators on the left hand side and then the power switch on the right. And you can see how that looks now with a close up view of it, just to make sure you know what's going on. But again, this is specific to this motherboard. It may vary on yours, so check the manual. Now I want to show quickly the wiring of the standard fans. So if you're planning on using the standard fans, this is how they connect up. So this is the 140 mil fans included with the case. They can connect up to the system fan header on the motherboard, but they do have that daisy chainable connection on them. So you can connect those two cables together and then connect them up to a sys fan header on the motherboard. So you could do one fan separately to one sys fan header and one to another, or you connect both fans together and then connect them up to a single connector and that'll save space and save wiring in the case as well you're going to have loads of extra wiring obviously you could alternatively as i showed earlier on use that fan splitter at the top back of the case i am wary though that it doesn't have any power and i don't think connecting four fans to it and then connecting them to a sys fan header is a good idea now i'm not using those standard fans i'm using these 140 mil rgb fans from fractal instead i'll leave the specs in the description so you can see i actually had these in my fractal torrent and now they're going in the north. But what I wanted to show was the logic for it, because these are slightly different, because obviously they have RGB cables on them as well as the power cables, so there's more cabling, and we're gonna run them to the front. But again, as I noted earlier, you can only fit two 140 mils on here, not three 140, which is a shame, because that would have looked really nice. So probably better off using 320 mils to fill up the front of that, especially if you're using hard disk drives and SSDs and you want to keep them cool. But with two fans set up there, we can run fan power to the fan controller or alternatively to the system fan headers on your motherboard. I'm using the controller here and then plugging that into the sys fan header. So just two fans on there rather than four. I'm not using the ones on the radiator, obviously they're being powered by something else, but you have that option to do that and then just plug those in and then that will ensure that they are cooling the case nicely. And then the RGB connection. So as I said earlier, you can obviously daisy chain these fans together. So like the ones on the radiator, these two can be connected with the five volt connection and then you can connect that to the motherboard. Now I'm at the stage of installing the all-in-one cooler and because I know the space is limited at the top I'm actually dealing with the cables first so I'm plugging in the radiator to the all-in-one pump header and CPU fans will go to the CPU fan as I said and then I'm going to install the CPU block on top of that uh, initially just to make sure the thermal paste doesn't get damaged and uh, it's seated down properly. So you just put the thumb screws over those standoffs that we put in earlier on and then secure those down and then we're putting the radiator in place. Now while I was doing this I noticed that I have a lot of cables to deal with and very limited places to run them to. Sadly and weirdly Fractal hasn't got any gaps above the motherboard to let you run these to the back which is a shame because we've got so many cables to deal with. So the way I tackled this was to actually cable tie all these tables together. So they're all already connected up in that daisy chain logic that I showed earlier on. 
And now I'm just tying them together to neaten them up a bit and minimize the amount of space that they're going to be taking up in the case because there are unfortunately a lot of cables now and it's kind of messy. Now the good thing about this case is with the mesh panel at least most of the cable shame is hidden away so even if the cable tidying isn't that great at the front it won't be obvious. The downside is obviously we don't want a mess at the front because that will restrict airflow. It's not too bad you see once it's tied up a bit and then I can run it through the rubber grommeting but it was still not ideal. So what I'm doing here is just connecting up the fan power and also the 5 volt RGB header before installing the AIO because it becomes a little bit fiddly afterwards and that's the reason why I did the 8 pin CPU power connectors as well for the power supply unit because I knew it was going to be fiddly once the all in one cooler's in and then that mounts the top with those little screws that I showed earlier and we just need to mount it in the various different points there I've skipped the process because it does take a long time to screw all those in but you have multiple different screws to secure this to the top of a case and again you can see that cable for the pump running across the top there and we need to make sure that's connected up as well but if you take a close look here you'll see just how much mess of cables there are on the top right and it does look a little bit neater but i am running the majority of it to the back luckily you won't be able to see most of it once the door's on but again chaining up all the rgb together so now we've got the fans on the radiator the pump head and the rgb fans that i've put on the front of the case they're all connected up into that same loop of rgb so the rgb lighting will go through all of them and then i just need to make sure it's connected to the 5 volt rgb header to ensure that the rgb will work if it's not connected to the motherboard obviously it's not going to work and then i'm going back and installing the rtx 3090 and i'm going to do some vertical mounting on this gpu in the near future in this case as well if you're curious and want to see what that looks like subscribe if you haven't already and i'll demo that but you can see with the tubes in this position they're kind of a little bit close to the gpu so maybe i would have been better off flipping the radiator around the other way you can adjust the tubes upwards though so because we're not really going to be seeing inside you could probably put them up a little bit if you're worried about it getting a bit hot and then I'm running the power cables for the graphics card from the bottom. Now there's a nice little gap down there. Initially I thought it wasn't going to look very good with all the cables sort of bundled down the bottom. But it comes out of the power supply shroud area down there and then you can just run those cables up. And because you had that front panel that I removed earlier on, you don't see a lot of it once the case is built. And you'll see that in a second. And then I just powered it on to make sure everything was working. You can see the RGB lighting. From the pump and all the fans is working nicely so it's come out as i wanted it to and a reasonably nice build i'm pretty happy with it now one thing to note about the lumen is that the cap is removable so you can actually reposition it so you can put the logo in a different place so you can actually install this so the cpu block can be in, positioned in different ways depending on your build and how you've chosen to do it so if i had the tubes on the other side for example i might want to flip the cap round and you can do that really easily so that's a nice option and then you can see what that looks like with the finished product now obviously i've still got the door off so a lot of this rgb is going to be hidden but i wanted to show you what the finished thing would look like potentially included with the mesh version of this case is this extra accessories box so this is a tray which will allow you to install a couple of 140 mil fans in it the idea here is that because we have a mesh panel on the side, we can then put side mounted fans that will blow into the case. And depending on what you've got installed on here, there are three different mounting points. The lowest one here obviously will blow cold air onto the graphics card. Although you do need to keep in mind the width of the GPU and the power cables that are coming out of it because they might interfere with it. And it was very tight on the 3090. If you have a 40 series card with one of those adapter cables, it might be even more problematic. Alternatively, you can put it further up and it will sit near where the CPU cooler is. And then also there's an option to mount it at the very top. But I found that the radiator blocked it, as I'll show you in a little while. So it's going to vary depending on whether you have it all in one cooler on the top or on the front of your case or maybe using a tower cooler and other things but a pretty interesting option so i'm using two more 140 mil fans with the same sort of logic that i did for the front fans so these are going to be connected to the sys fan header on the motherboard and then the rgb just joins up to that group of other fans so that all the rgb is synced across all the different fans 
with one connector in a chained affair. So pretty straightforward. So basically putting those in facing outwards. So the, obviously the back of them presses against the back of the tray. The back of the tray goes into the case. And then it's going to be pulling cold air through the front mesh or through the side mesh and blowing it straight onto the graphics card, which should help with cooling and adds an interesting aesthetic to the case as well, because you can see the RGB through the mesh panel too. Very unusual design. I've not seen, mind you, most modern cases have a glass, tempered glass panel on the side. So this is pretty unique anyway. And then this mounts on the side here. Now, um, I'd actually not follow this just yet, but I'm just showing the process for this. And don't forget to plug the cables in for the fans, obviously. And also check that it will mount. But the reason I say don't do it just yet is you actually need that front cable hiding tray back on first because it clips in. So the reason the tray has those sort of two prongs sticking out at the end of it is because it plugs into those bits of the case. It's fairly unusual, but it secures it nicely in place. But again, system fan header and RGB light, make sure they're connected up and there's also two thumb screws to secure this tray to the case as well that we need to deal with in a second but i wanted to access this now obviously there's a lot more cables with adding these extra fans in so you need to think about where they go and make sure they don't interfere with anything and as i said watch out that these aren't going to cause any problems with your gpu power cables because you wouldn't want the fan tray pressed up against that and causing problems potentially it's quite tight with the 3090 if you had a smaller gpu it wouldn't be a problem and then those thumb screws just secure into the back of the case. So there's various different points along the back of the case, whether you're mounting this at the bottom or in the middle or at the top, you have those three different options and there's multiple different mounting points for it. But again, I had to use a screwdriver to finish it off. Uh, really nice, well worth doing, I think. I'm gonna do some thermal testing to see how much difference it makes actually. Hopefully come back with a report on that. But in theory, it's brilliant because usually you'd have fans on the bottom of your case, which you don't have on this one. And now we've got air blowing from the front and from the side, and it looks really nice as well. You can see the finished product without the mesh panel on here and the RGB effects of that and also just the general setup. Now, you don't have to use RGB. Obviously, you could just get some more of those fractal 140 mil fans and put them on there and just use standard fans now to install the mesh panel back on you need to first put the cable hiding area back on as well so this sort of front tray that clips in at the bottom and there's a thumb screw at the top and you can't do it when the fan brackets in place as i said earlier so you need to install this first so don't do what i did and follow those steps because you need to put that on first and then slot the fan tray into it and then secure it to the case as you'll see now because those prongs stick out there and then they line up with the holes on that and then it clips into the case so it's a little bit fiddly but the logic makes sense the whole system's then flush and one end of the tray is not sticking out and it's secured as well so it's not rattling around when the fans are spinning which is obviously ideal because you wouldn't want loads of extra noise for no reason and then just test to make sure everything's working as it should be and we're now getting near the end of what is a pretty nice build i actually enjoyed building this case apart from the thumb screws has been relatively problem free and you can see we can just adjust this tray if we want to the downside being you can't put it on the top but in theory it's fairly easy to get it blowing on your cpu ram mvme drivers you can move it further up and if you want to, if you had a low profile CPU cooler, for example, you could put it at the top. If you're using a tower cooler rather than an all-in-one cooler, it can be mounted at the top as well. But like I said, the radiator on my all-in-one cooler that I'm using here is just a bit too wide. So it's blocking it. The fans and the radiator are in the way there. So something to bear in mind, I wouldn't bother trying that. If you're copying me, don't bother trying to put it at the top. But you do have the options of bottom mounting and then the mesh panel goes back on and then you've got the final results of the build. So obviously there's been a lot of details in here and I'm aware this has been a very long video. So if you've made it to the end and you found it useful, let me know in the comments. Drop me a like and subscribe if you haven't already because it really helped me out. It took me hours to put this together, but hopefully you've enjoyed it. And then you get to see that there is actually some benefit to the RGB. You can still see it. it's a bit more subtle than your usual with tempered glass finish. And you just have that nice 
result there. And it's a really nice looking case with some really nice highlights to it. And despite my messy cabling at the back, you can still close that rear panel with relative ease as well. And stick around, come back for the S24 RGB video and let me know what you think. Thanks for watching. You've made it right to the end of the video, you brilliant legend you. If you've enjoyed it, click that subscribe button, give me a thumbs up and drop me a comment down below if you've got any questions. If you really enjoyed it, consider joining the channel and see the benefits of doing so. Check out these other videos. You might well find them interesting or useful. And most importantly, have a great life.